Yo grinders, what's going on? This is Characters coming at you with episode number 6 of Common Pitfalls, the series where we, where we delve into the most common errors that beginning and fairly sort of pre-intermediate players um, sort of fall into on a regular basis. Um, episode 6, we are going to move on to talk about a concept which you may have heard before. I think I spoke about it in my Tilt series, which was maybe like a year and a bit ago. It's called Inchworm. And more specifically, for our purposes today, inchworm neglect, which is the neglect of this practice. Um, so yeah, as always, go back and watch this series all the way through if you haven't already. This is basically a, a sort of saga where we run through all the common pitfalls that there are for our beginning players. In my experience as a coach, forgive the ridiculous sirens of the inefficient Italian um, emergency services. They, for some reason, need to send out like four things for absolutely everything, it would seem. Um, so yeah, it's a bit noisy here, I'm afraid. Let's get into this anyway. Um, inchworm neglect. So, I have my whole story from the very beginning. Okay, so, what is inchworm? I've made some cool diagrams here. Um, this is kind of like, as you can see, the the non-PowerPoint um, artists sort of approach to creating visual learning. Um, I do my best and hopefully it has a certain rustic charm to it even if it's not um, full of bright colourful moving graphics with cool 2014 effects. Um, yeah, I'm a bit old school, what can I say? Um, so what is Inchworm? First of all we need to talk about what this actually means. Um, it's a learning technique or an approach to learning. Um, that's used in poker. Um, generally, it's used to ensure that there's a smooth progression in your ability. Um, that's to say that it's used to ensure that you're learning in a way that's stable and is sort of fluid as well. That you're not like all over the place in your approach. Um, one major, a way I could generalize this pitfall actually would be to say that just one major thing people do wrong in general is that they don't have a very organized structure to their learning like when you learn when you do a course in university that's done for you you know the course is set out in a certain way you start off with an easy easy modules introduction to x y and z and you sort of build up and you build up your knowledge slowly you make sure you're constantly improving all the things that you're bad at and developing the skills that you need in order you know in order that you can one day do the end result very well like write a good thesis or dissertation or essay or whatnot and really get into like a subject. In poker, people tend to, in my experience, sort of approach it in a, a less organized kind of um, sort of haphazard way where they just sort of um, join the site, take a few logical steps, but don't really make them, don't really knit them together in a very logical way. So Inchworm is going to make sure that we do knit these ideas together well and we sort of make sure that our learning is in poker as it would be in a sort of professional learning environment where the structure is done for us. But we need to make the structure on our own in poker. This is the difference. We're the ones that are responsible for that. And we need to make sure that we're putting this into effect. Um, so Inchworm is used to organize your learning and to minimize mental clutter, mess, and disarray. Um, it's the same when you learn like a language or something. For instance, you do a lot of um, learning new ideas, new grammar points, new vocabulary, but you also do a lot of revising and practicing. Um, it's not enough just to learn a concept, to learn a piece of vocabulary once and then expect that you'll be able to produce it instantly in the natural flow of conversation. You need to practice your speaking skills, you need to practice your um, your understanding of it in a more subconscious sort of way so that it becomes more ingrained in you. And Interim is kind of the same. It's a way of making sure that we don't learn lots of things in really shallow depth that just causes like clutter and mess and confusion. Um, you don't want to have like 200,000 um, only partially learned concepts all bouncing around your head. Rather, you want to have like 20 concepts that you know very well and therefore know how to organize into a nice logical structure very quickly and easily. So, Inchworm is a way of doing that as well. And Inchworm is something that I kind of take to exist now. Like, it is it's like some kind of um, omniscient sort of presence that's just always there and you need to make sure that you're respecting it kind of like god if you are that way inclined i suppose so inchworm is constantly there you every poker player has an inchworm and we need to make sure that we respect it and this will make more sense in a minute so this pitfall is possibly the most common and destructive one that we've encountered yet i think it's really common 
um, just because people aren't really aware of it. I mean, they might be to some extent. They might be aware that, you know, I need to practice the things I learn. I need to revise them. I need to look at my own sort of weaknesses rather than just trying to learn new stuff from instructors or more experienced players or videos or whatever. But a lot of the time, I think people don't organize it into such a sort of refined way. Um, but a lot of people just aren't really aware at all that they're approaching learning in a really terrible way. Um, I've had students in the past who are really, really big on just absorbing as much new material as possible. And every week in a session, they want to cover a new topic that they've heard about in one of my videos or someone else's videos, or they'll want to just learn all about how to construct a range for a certain very specific type of spot. And sometimes I have to, I find myself telling students that we're not doing anywhere near enough sort of introspective review of their own game. And we've not, you know, we're basically not doing anything to to fix the holes that are already very, very evident to me and very gaping. And, you know, without fixing those holes, often it can be impossible to incorporate a lot of new material. A lot of more advanced material naturally depends upon you having a solid foundation. And so if that foundation starts to fall apart in some way, um, you're going to have trouble. So let's now actually sort of get to the... Let's cut to the chase here and talk about what the inchworm actually looks like. What is the nature of the beast? Well, I've got two two ends here. I've got the rear end of, of worm and front end of worm. I couldn't think of a more um, sort of less potentially rude way to say that I could have said the back of the worm, but then I had front end, rear end just sounded like the, you know, the tail of the worm. That would have been better, wouldn't it? The tail and the head. Of the worm that would have been less um well the worms don't really have tails as the thing they just kind of have one end and another end so who knows i think i'm gonna have to stick with rear end yeah the rear end of the worm is all about um identifying and fixing your leaks it's like the back of your game if you imagine your game as this sort of fluid process like this liquid just sort of flowing through a tube just gradually as you progress then the rear end is just is all there is always going to be like the rear end of it like the stuff that has been there for the longest that is you know not caught up to the front end and never will it's the stuff at the back the stuff you learned initially your foundations um it needs to be very very strong in poker um the rear end of the worm is essentially it's essentially the way that the way you learn reflectively um how you sort of look at your own game introspectively how you fix the leaks. So it's all about identifying and fixing leaks for sure. Um, if you have some major leaks in your foundations, you just, like I said before, you're not really going to be able to learn new concepts well. There's going to be disarray. You might learn a new concept, but then apply it completely incorrectly because this foundational you know, hole in your game that should never be there is just causing you to misapply everything you learn. So making sure you have this solid foundation is absolutely paramount. Um, identifying and fixing leaks, basically. So how do we how do we go about identifying a leak? Well, we have to review, 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 review. As I always say, um, we have to get other people to look at our game as well, like more experienced players and that kind of thing. Posting on forums for sure is a type of introspective review. Um, in order to find a leak, we also need to take a step back and sort of admit that we're not very good poker players and. You know, if we have like a big ego problem, we already think we've got everything solved and we're not willing to take people's opinions on board. And it's something I used to be very guilty of. And I still am in certain walks of life, actually. It's, I think it's a difficult thing to become sort of fully detached from from the ego, from the self that wants to protect you and tell you that you're amazing at stuff. But you do need to do that. And you need to sort of be able to be able to open yourself up to critique in order to identify where your leaks lie in the first place. And that's only half the battle because then you've got to go on and figure out how to actually plug these these leaks up. Um, often it'll be getting a, a variety of opinions from better players, posting on the forums, hiring a coach, talking in a discussion group, um, like the one that I run and stuff like that. My students tend to get a hell of a lot out of just having each other. There's a lot of them now, they sort of bounce ideas back and forward. And it's a mutual understanding. They help each other with their own leaks. There's very little ego in that place is very little it's instant messaging it's just a good way to sort of when you when you sort of you post a hand people tell you oh you've done this this and this wrong then you notice you've got a leak and then you can post some more questions about how you should fix it um so yeah the rear end of the worm is all about doing that it's all about finding where your holes are and fixing them 
um, you're making sure that your foundations are solid that part of the trails behind the head of the worm as you can see with its big smiling face there that's always like looking to that look at that happy face it's looking to sort of delve into new into new um, locations new bits of soil find some more nutrients in different parts of the earth basically to incorporate more information but the tail is always going to be dragging behind and if that starts to fall to pieces the worm is going to have a lot of problems moving properly and functioning so you need to make sure this is all in check at the back. Repairing misconceptions. Um, often, you might start off in poker with a lot of misconceptions like we've talked about before. Um, there are a lot of innate misconceptions that are ingrained in us because of the way things are in the rest of the world. And then when we go into the poker realm, um, there's a big disparity between the way we're used to things being and the way things actually are. Um, so we can have those kind of misconceptions, but we can also have misconceptions that form due to inchworm neglect um, as we sort of learn more and more and more new concepts and we put our brain under a lot of pressure and we sort of overload it with information when the foundation isn't very solid and we don't have that good a grasp on, on the fundamentals of the game it can quickly lead to this sort of degeneration where we start to form all these ideas they're kind of half-baked they're not really they don't cohere well together they don't form like a good web of sort of a good web of beliefs and they're all over the place and it causes conflicting beliefs like on the one hand I want to do this because of A but I also want to do this because of G and A and G are like a million miles apart because the worm is like completely broken there's nothing in the middle there's no imagine it like a, like a spinal sort of a spinal cord to the brain if there's like breaks in your spinal cord you're screwed you can't do anything your poker learning is not totally dissimilar to that because if you do have these misconceptions at the back of the worm um, and you don't repair them, then they can cause you to apply everything at the front end completely incorrectly. And let's let's make this a little bit less abstract and metaphorical just for a second um, and give an example. Let's say that um, you've started learning about uh, cold calling three bets in position with big suited broadways against the polarized three betting range. Okay, So this is certainly not jumping in at the beginning, this is something fairly advanced. It's good to flat these broadways here because they dominate a lot of your opponent's 3-bit range and the opener opened on the button and he's going to just be folding a ton because his range is so weak. So you're going to end up with a strong looking range, a perceived, perceived strong range that connects well on a bunch of boards. Your opponent's going to miss a lot of the flops that you miss and just check fold them. The ones that he see bets you're going to hit with your big broadways anyway. This kind of thing, it's going to be a decent spot for you. So there are arguments for cold calling here. If you understand all the fundamentals of poker, there's nothing wrong with learning a bit about that and then incorporating it into your game. But if you don't know very much about poker, if you've got all these leaks at the back, such as you just don't understand what it means to have a perceived range, if you don't know anything about what your perceived range is or you don't even have an idea that your opponents are putting you on a range and you've no idea what that's like then you're going to you're not going to really be able to take advantage of that you're going to get confused you might also have other foundational leaks such as you might think that uh, calling three bets light is generally bad that's one thing you learn very early on don't call too many three bets but then that belief sort of conflicts with something you hear in a video about um cold calling with big suited broadways in this big blind versus small blind versus button spot or something like that and the result is that you have this new thing you want to apply but it's just so disorderly because it's clashing with everything else you ever knew about three betting why would you want you know that initiative is a great thing you know that you shouldn't call too many c-bets why are you putting yourself in a situation with a quote-unquote dominatable hand you don't fully understand it because your foundational knowledge just isn't solid enough for you to understand the situation fully um which is why you know coaches do try to explain things and sort of always throw in a disclaimer that it's a very unique spot and it depends on a lot of factors and the foundation should still apply and things like that but if you don't have a solid rear end of the worm if you like then you know you're not going to have the support for the head to roam into all these places all these concepts the head's trying to pick up are not going to be um solidifiable basically you're not going to be able to solidify them so it's also about reviewing and consolidating ideas as well. Just like when you learn a language, it's not enough to just learn some vocabulary. You know, you have to consolidate it, you have to practice it, you have to continuously use it and train your brain how to recognize certain patterns and things like that. And poker is very much the same. Um, you need to know, as you guys probably know, I'm, I'm big on the key factors in the situation. My approach to learning poker is very much about knowing what factors are relevant and 
which situations and what bits of foundational poker expertise will allow you to um, apply those factors properly, basically. So you want to review all the time. Just review your hands, review your play, learn from your mistakes, notice trends and patterns. More on that later. I'm going to give a list of like the 10 sort of commandments to making sure you don't neglect your own inchworm in your game um, and consolidating your ideas as well. When you say there's something that you know fairly well, you've known for a long time, but if you've not reviewed it lately, you'd be amazed how it can be a lot harder to recall. It might still be there, but these access paths in the brain kind of deteriorate a little bit over time so that if you don't actively recall the actual the thing, the concepts you learned in the first place, you might start to misapply it and you might start to develop a few holes in your game at the back there. So make sure that you consolidate your ideas so that they are actually um, instantiated in the right way when you play to make sure that they are actually, that you that you use these ideas properly because if you don't sort of go over the actual theory of what you know um, you might find that it starts to distort and then when you try and use that reasoning in game it doesn't happen as you know coherently as it could and you start making a ton of mistakes that you might not even be aware of because you might think that you're just applying the concept but really your brain has changed the concept over time um, and it's now not what it was when you originally learned it because you know we don't we're not like bookcases that just store physical things the brain is like you're constantly having to to access these different parts with neurons firing and stuff so you've got to consolidate it and perform the same sort of thoughts a lot for it to sink in and for it to become like rigidly in your brain and not get changed over time so yeah all new material needs a shitload of revision and consolidation and application um the front end of the worm I think I've talked about most of this already, but it's about learning new concepts, of course, and this is not something that you, when I talk about inchworm balance, um, it might sound kind of unbalanced so far, because I've focused mainly on the rear end and how people tend to not do these things enough, but also um, the front end is not to be ignored. You don't want to become a player who just does nothing but reviews his own hands all the time and doesn't really learn any new material you need to always be acquiring new tools as you progress as you be as your foundations become more solid um your inchworm becomes more uh, versatile and better at learning new things and so of course you should you should honor that by learning some new stuff as well and like applying new material to your game and acquiring these new concepts that you can you can learn how to use mid-session um there are a bunch of enlightenments, like epiphanies, I suppose. It's maybe a better word in poker, where one day you watch something in a video and then you see it exemplified in the battlefield itself, like during your sessions, and you just think, wow, I never realized that I could just do that before, and my opponents are just playing so badly against it. Like, why have I not been, like, men raising the button against these kind of players all the time? Why have I only just realized this now? And when you have epiphanies, that's awesome, and that's like the front end of the worm inching forward and making more progress. But make sure it's supported when that happens. Like, never deny yourself an epiphany in poker. Like, when an, ep an epiphany happens, embrace it, but make sure you look into it and you, you truly understand it and you solidify it before moving on. If you have a bunch of, of epiphanies but you never consolidate them, then you have all these great ideas that could turn into, like, really solid foundations, but end up just sort of getting distorted over time and changed and maybe you even forget them entirely. Maybe you you found you find you're one of these players who has several epiphanies a week but almost can't remember what the ones from the last week were. And that's a real shame because the reason an epiphany is so important is that it's you figuring out something really concrete and you want to make sure that you consolidate that knowledge and keep the worm fluid. As you can see this is a happy worm that we've got here. This model of worm is, is pretty pleased. His face is smiling. Um, look at the connectors. Like The connecting segments of the worm body are all completely in sync. There's no irregularity there. The tail with the three T's is like looks fairly healthy. Looks like a, a good sort of like stinger on the end of the worm to sort of punish his enemies. He looks like a healthy beast, basically. This is what you want your your inchworm to look like. Solid links all the way from the head to the tail. Every new thing is being connected and revised and consolidated so that the worm is a happy creature. The head is moving forward, but the tail is moving forward at the, the exact same time. The worm isn't like breaking into pieces. It's just one fluid thing, just like 
inching across the soil, learning new poker concepts all the time and consolidating them and just becoming a beast. This guy is going to make it to like 100, 200 NL from 10 NL in a matter of eight months, I would say, pretty easily if he puts in the volume. So that's a happy end sperm. There's review going on all the time, there's repairing of misconceptions, there's consolidating ideas, but there's also a thirst to strive forward and learn new concepts and then learn how to apply them fully and consolidate them. Okay, so so what's the problem that, what is this pitfall that I've been sort of hinting at to say the least? Um, well, newer players love to inhale as much new material as possible. Again, it goes back to that whole thing, what's the innate urge when you first start playing poker? What does your... What have your teachings in life um, directed you to do as a new poker player? Um, when you learn a lot of things, okay, language is not so much the case, but there are a lot of things where it is just about learning a lot of facts. I remember being back in school and a lot of the learning process was just how many facts can you remember about something such that you can regurgitate them in an exam and then instantly forget them again. And that's an, a, a terrible way, obviously, to teach anything, but it is, unfortunately, the way... And certainly in my country that things were done at school, it felt like that a lot of the time. You weren't so much taught to be a free-thinking um, person. You were just taught to remember lots and lots of stuff and be able to recall it to get a good grade a lot of the time. Not always, not in all subjects, but I think, so there, this cramming kind of approach, let's face it, like when we go to university, when we go to college, when we're in school, we just cram, right? Like you always mean to study, but you end up leaving it to the last minute and you end up just cramming all this material. Um, this is instilled in us. So new players do this in poker too. They think the more they cram, the more videos they watch and the more the articles they read and the more things they understand, the better they're going to be at poker. They're going to understand more concepts than their opponents and they're going to be able to, to own their opponents because they know about cold calling the three bets out position, four bet, cold four bet bluffing and their opponents don't. So, yeah, but of course what happens is that they don't spend enough time consolidating and doing all the stuff that we just spoke about at the rear of the worm. Um, although they may seek help in certain spots on then forums, on the forums, I guess, review time is usually dwarfed by time spent watching videos, reading articles, trying out new ideas. Um, so, yeah, and by trying out new ideas, I don't mean like cementing them through practical application. I mean just sort of seeing what will happen, experimenting. Maybe there's even a bit of results orientation, situational results orientation, like we spoke about a couple of episodes ago going on there. But they're just not spending enough time reviewing, basically. Like, I was terrible at poker until one day I just developed this habit of reviewing hands every single time I played a session for about 20 minutes after the session minimum and then posting up the ones that I had no idea what to do and when I was grinding before I was in Italy and you know again when I'll be grinding again in the summer or whatnot I will use the same approach basically I will continue to review hands in this way um, watching videos is important yes it's awesome to be a part of grinder school because a site like this helps with both ends of the worm. It helps, A, because you have the forums and the community and coaches available that can help you out with the, the former stuff, with the rear end, being able to consolidate and fix your own leaks, basically repair your own holes. But at the same time, they can help you with the front end because in every video there will be a gold mine of new concepts that you can grab some of and try to try to implement into, your, into the front end of your worm. And it's kind of like a digestion process. Like... As you swallow a new concept, you want it to like go all the way to the back of the worm where it finds like consolidation and it's you know it's permanently gonna be placed there and it's not gonna get changed or distorted and you're not gonna forget it. So you want to make sure that when you do learn new material you learn it well. Um so new players tend to spend way, way too much time just watching video after video, watching three videos, taking notes and Videos are great. They're a great way of learning new material, and they're also a great way of finding your holes. Like videos do both things. They not only do they teach you like new stuff that you never thought about before and give you epiphanies, but or lead you to epiphanies. But they also allow you to think, "Wow, I've been doing that really badly. Like I've been doing the exact opposite of what that coach has just recommended, and his reasoning has allowed me to see why it's really bad." So yeah, videos can do both. But you need to make sure that when you watch a video, you take both kinds of approach with it. You're not just thinking in terms of what could I do in the future that's new? What could I add? You're also thinking in terms of, well, how would I play that spot? That's why it's great to like go through a video meticulously and use it as an asset, use it as a tool for both of these different kinds of learning. Um, 
of course draw new insights from it but also pause the video you know when a spot comes up think how would i play this spot i think i would do this i think the instructor should do this because x y and z play the video see what the instructor says see what the see if there's any difference or see if what if his thought process matches yours if not where does it differ um why does it differ is the instructor right in what he's saying are there good reasons to think it's true um so yeah when you go through a video and stuff don't just sort of passively leech and suck out all the new ideas but try to use them to be critical of your own game at the same time and think about how you actually how your game is and find the leaks to fill there, there are always so many leaks to fill at the back of the worm like you can never really do enough of that um, as long as you've got some kind of balance you do still seek some new material like it's hard to review too much that's definitely one thing I would say so newer players tend to overfeed the front of the worm while the back falls into chaos it just happens all the time you get people saying things like well I watched on this this video recently and I've started doing X Y and Z but they don't really understand why they're doing X Y and Z and the material they've not digested the material and in the most sensible way they've just kind of like swallowed it really quickly and it's just gone to the back of the, war the worm and gelled with a few holes that were already there and just sort of created more weird misconceptions and you know you get that a lot and sometimes people something resonates with people quite a lot like they'll hear one thing in a video that just really resonates with them and they'll always remember it but they'll remember it kind of like out of context and they won't know how to really apply it but because it's res resonated so well within them they sort of they cling on to that to that um, piece of knowledge and sometimes even you know overrule the fundamentals that they used to apply well with this new bit of knowledge that they've that struck more of a chord with them and it's in their head so it can be really dangerous actually to overfeed the front worm especially if you're not keeping the back end in check um, many holes are are opened then by the non thorough reckless incorporate incorporation of new materials um, a lot of the time, a leak doesn't just come about of its own accord, it comes about because someone has learned something in a very vague way that's just not that's just not going to be appropriate for, for having this kind of balance that we're seeking here. Um, so many, many leaks are caused by people digesting information incorrectly, people hearing some information and then just blindly applying it to all situations, um, this kind of thing. So these holes, the longer you leave them, once you've created them um, by this inchworm neglection, um, they fester and they grow over time as well. That's the thing, like a leak, an undealt with leak can sort of spread and it can cause other leaks because what a leak is, is a sort of oversight on your part. It's like a, it's something that you're doing incorrectly, but you, okay, there's two kind, main kinds of leaks. There's things you're doing incorrectly that you have no idea that you're doing incorrectly. Now, these kind of leaks are really dangerous because you don't even know they're there and they're sort of like a black hole and they're causing other leaks as well. Because you have this misconception that you're not even aware of, your reasoning is causing you to form new ideas that are also flawed. It's like you're building your pyramid of knowledge on very shaky, unsolid foundations. So that's not good. The other kind of leak is where you know you're bad at something, but you just suck at it, but you're working on it. And that, that kind of leak is totally fine to have as long as you dedicate time to it. If you have those kind of leaks that you know all about them, but you can't be bothered doing anything about them, you'd rather learn new material and just hope they go away, and or you don't want to address them because you don't have a sort of tamed enough ego to admit you have them, then you've got a real problem as well. But generally speaking, if you're aware of your leaks, you should be able to to give a lot of time towards fixing those leaks, so they're okay. But it is these ones that you just don't know you've got because you've digested so much new stuff and you've not reviewed your game and extensively enough, you've not seeked help from other people on the forums enough. Um, you think you're doing things well, but in fact you're playing awfully in a lot of situations you never knew about. One of the best things people get out of coaching, in my opinion, is the initial couple of sessions where they just see all these leaks that they never saw before that were a huge deal, and they sort of say, wow, this is terrible how I've been playing for so long. And once they've found that, they can make these massive patch-ups in the back of the worm and just come along leaps and bounds. And then that then in turn liberates the head of the worm to go forward again. The whole damn beast like starts slithering on um, in a nice way. And it just it can be a real a really great way to clear roadblocks in your poker development um, is to be introspective and discover these leaks. Something is holding you back. You know, if you're playing 100k hands 
of 10 and L and you're not getting anywhere, yeah, you could be going through horrendous extended variance, but more likely you're not getting anywhere because there are serious flaws at the back of your game, at the back of your worm, like holding you back. And when you find out what those are, you're liberated to, you know, not only be playing better because you fix them, but to strive forward and become a fluid beast like this guy on the last slide. That's what you were aiming for. You're aiming to be this guy here with a happy face. But sadly, often new players look like this, or even far worse, actually. At least this one, the front of the worm, like in the short term when they first swallow something, they do apply it like, okay, this is the kind of inchworm where the student has swallowed new material, has a, is applying it like in some kind of organized way. Uh, for, you know, for the, the week after he learns something, he kind of understands it and applies it, um, but he's just swallowing so much that there's this sort of backlog developing at the back. Um, and there are so many leaks that have been growing over time and being fed by the new material, they're not getting dealt with, they're not getting filled. And that explains this whole TTG, XBDS mess that you've got going at the back there. Um, you've got all these spaces as well, just where different ideas have sort of been swallowed down on top of each other that don't really relate very well. One minute he's learning about four betting, the next minute this guy is learning about like fold equity on the flop. And, you know, the next day he's learning how to triple barrel rivers and three bet pots. And he's just not looking at like the fundamentals, not reviewing his play in common situations that come up all the time. It's like last time when we spoke, all these pitfalls are kind of interlinked, you know, they all kind of link up into one gigantic pit, but there are all sort of different sections of it. This links back um, to people not knowing what kind of spots to, to look for, basically people looking at all the wrong kinds of situation, looking at the big hands, the coolers, wanting to know how to construct a range for a five bet pot, but not just looking at the situations that are so common, you know, big pot biased and all that. People love to look at the, the spots where they got stacked. They think this must be where they're losing most of their money. But over the long run, it's often these common situations like we talked about before. The common situations, like just how effectively you see bet the flop, how well you react to see bets, how you're open sizing, you know, you general three betting range in common default situations, your understanding of pot odds, of implied odds, of fold equity, just your general understanding of poker, um, these things are at the very back of the worm, they're at the very core, and when they start to fall into disarray, like there's just not really going to be any hope, so you just have to make sure you keep on top of that all the time. Also, it's like a backlog, like the more... I often like it when I get a very new student who's only just taken up poker a few weeks ago, because although I know that... I'm going to have to instill a lot of new stuff in them and they're going to need a lot of work to get them up to scratch and to just get the basics down enough to sort of enough to make any progress um, at the same time I know that there's not going to be this absolute mess that they've created through whatever kind of learning process they used to have a lot of students come to me just completely messed up at the back of the worm and you just I just have to sort of start delving into it and start clearing away their misconceptions and getting them to see and admit that they do have these misconceptions and getting them to refine the drop down a few stakes maybe even refine the whole way they approach poker um so i've had a lot of students like that it's a very common thing and i think it's a lot of it's down to inchworm neglect which is why I, i'm giving this segment this topic an entire segment to itself and stressing that it is one of the more uh, common and severe leaks that people can have so yeah, you don't want to end up in this kind of situation. Um, so we better, maybe time that we start thinking about how we can actually, how we can actually solve this. What can we do to ensure that we don't fall into this trap, into this pitfall? So this is my 10 step, step solution. It's something I just came up with today. I've never really formally thought about ways to ensure that you have a healthy inchworm before, like in this much detail. So I'm going to, have a think about what you, you know guys assess this see what you think about it it's very much a new idea um and i'm up i'm open for getting criticized about this you might have other ideas that you can add to this list you know share stuff on the thread if you're interested in it definitely there might be other ones this is not exhaustive this is just 10 good ideas that i think i've had for how to have a healthier inchworm and how to avoid this pitfall so number one is always be aware of your current three biggest leaks this might sound difficult, like how do you know what your biggest leaks are? That's why you hire a coach. I guess what I mean is be aware of three leaks that happen all the time. Ones that you find yourself constantly, spots you find yourself constantly being told you're playing badly in, spots where you find yourself confused during live play and during analysis in, 
and spots that you think you might be misplaying that are just extremely common and are going to occur so much that they affect your win rate. These are like your biggest leaks or leaks that are just so fundamental to your overall understanding of poker. They're like the sort of core values, uh, the core ideas that are going to branch off into lots of different um, areas. For example, if you don't understand pot odds, then that's going to screw you up in so many different ways because not only are you not going to be calling enough three bets pre-flop sometimes or calling too many or set mining too much pre-flop, but you're also going to be you know, not floating enough when you're getting a really good price on the flop. You're not going to be um, barreling the turn when you think you can make a really small bet size and get your opponent to fold. You're not going to be calling the river light enough because you think you're beat 60% of the time, even though that a perfectly great reason to call because you only need 30% equity or whatever but yeah you get the picture like not understanding pot odds is a huge deal so one of your three biggest leaks could be something like that it could be one of these things that's very very common and essential for the rest of your understanding um, so write them down and as you plug them seek new ones this is one way of just clearing out the rear end of the worm when you fix some leaks seek more leaks Try to understand them and clear those out as well. Just keep going. It's like an organization process. The more you clear out, the healthier state your worm is in, the more it can sort of slither forward into new ventures and learn new concepts. I feel like I've been a bit biased in this video uh, towards the rear end. It's just because this is where the pitfall lies. Of course, you still want to learn new ideas. You don't want to stagnate and just be doing the same reviewing with a sort of limited set of tools. You need to build your tools and learn more concepts but you also need to keep your foundation solid so it's very much a balance um, review every single session noting trends and confusion and error making so one way that you can find the three biggest leaks is to review every single session and look out for trends there will be patterns use hold a manager and poker tracker have good features these days um, wherein you can actually tag a hand a different color depending on the type of hand it is and there could be low you make your own custom colors you have loads and loads of different review tags using the old colorometer on the Mac, we can slide the thing into all the different, you can slide your cursor about the, the circle of colors and just choose loads of different ones for different kinds of spots. If you do that, you can sort of organize spots into lots of different archives and start to learn which ones you're bad at. You can then delve into that further, see which sub kind of spot you're bad at and find your, note these trends, but the main thing is to review every single session. Don't let a session go by that you don't review. It's like with anything. An analogy I can think of immediately is like stopping smoking. Like one, the, as soon as you have one cigarette, it's very easy to start having more and just slowly sort of go down that slippery slope back into being a smoker. Um, if you don't review one session, you kind of teach yourself it's okay not to do that. I would be meticulous with this, guys. Obviously, you can't always do it right away, but make sure a session doesn't go by unreviewed. And yeah, you'll make leaps and bounds in improving the rear end of the inchworm for sure. That was quite a mouthful. Got this um, carrot, orange, and lemon juice right now. It's a strange combination, but it works really well. It's nice. It's one of the good things about going to a new country. You discover new small joys of life like juice. I like my juice. So, number three is to seek help from more experienced players or hire a coach to direct your learning. Don't be one of these guys who jumps in and already thinks that they can just look after themselves. Like poker is like a, a community and it's that way for a reason because what goes around comes around and when you help other people, other people help you. When you're an active, respected part of a community, other people are more willing to help you, you know? And building up that persona and being that person who's willing to help others not only helps you like directly and that you get to think about a hand and talk about it and that obviously always helps your your analytical skills and your poker mindset but also when the when you become part of a community like the skype group i was talking about earlier they're really close our students are really tight they sort of they're all there for each other and they're all going through the same thing and they're all working towards the same thing so seek help from more experienced players and also talk about hands with less experienced players just because someone's a bit less experienced than you doesn't mean they won't be slightly better at certain aspects of poker you might be better overall but they might have a better understanding of floating than you do or something like that so be open-minded and seek seek help and if you want direction in this area then definitely consider hiring a coach just having an experienced poker player to guide you every step of the way is like so invaluable i don't mean to like i'm kind of advertising but yeah just in general even if i wasn't taking on students right now i'd say exactly the same thing hire a coach there are lots of there are lots of them about the place and a good few in grinder school as well so 
um, it can definitely help when you, especially if you reach a point where you just don't really know where to go. If you reach a point where you're sort of a little bit lost, so you don't know which direction to take or how to plan your learning, it's a good time to seek help. Um, plan your learning in an orderly, balanced way. So have a schedule. You know, don't just jump in and load up Grinder School and click on the top video and watch it and take some notes. That's not very organized. One way you can do this is just like through habitually reviewing all your lessons, all your sessions. Another thing you can do is write down your main goals for the week. What are you going to incorporate in the front end of the worm? And what are you going to do to make sure the back end of the worm catches up? Plan out, designate your time. That takes you on to point five. Spend at least 70% of your time in the rear end at first. If you're a newer player, this is mandatory. If you're more experienced, you can start to slide the other way and learn more um new material just basically because you'll be a lot better at incorporating the new material you've got the solid foundation already you are a stronger worm you can swallow more earth and get more nutrients from it you don't need to constantly make make sure that your foundations are solid because they are but at first and for the first couple of years of your poker journey if you're not one of these uber successful kids that rockets through the stakes they're less common these days sadly but if you're one of them, then you probably shouldn't even bother watching this video because you're already a better player than I am. But if you're not, then if you're like the rest of us and you're just a mere mortal in the poker world, then you do need to spend a lot more time on the rear end. It sounds a bit wrong to keep calling it the rear end in all these different contexts. But, you know, yeah, I think it's the best way to go. Let's also space out our feasting on new material to allow time for digestion. There's nothing wrong with learning new material, but don't like learn seven things in one day. Learn one thing or one area of stuff, and then some sub points coming off from that. Practice it, you know, um, solidify it and cement it before. Allow time for digestion, basically. Don't swamp your inchworm with all this new stuff because then it just has to swallow really quickly. It doesn't get time to suck the nutrients out of the earth it's swallowing. Um, worms eat earth i don't even know what worms eat maybe they eat little bugs and stuff nah little bugs in the earth i don't know maybe someone can educate me what do they actually eat yeah i'd be intrigued to find out i could just google it of course but yeah um but anyway like the more stuff you swallow really quickly the more you try to digest all of a sudden the less easily you're going to be able to digest it like try going out for food and just eating it 10 times the pace of everybody else like you won't <laughs> you though you won't be able to try as many of the different things if you go to a buffet and just fill your plate like full of one thing and eat eat it really quickly you know you're not gonna be able to experience all the different stuff you know you need to leave time the best way to make use of like when you go for like a chinese buffet right is to sort of have a plate chill for a bit have another plate chill for a bit have a plate you know make sure you can get as much out of it as you can so allow that time for digestion it's totally essential. Um, for every what, there's a why in poker. Do not be one of these people. Unfortunately, there are really common um, new players who just take everything they hear as gospel and then preach it onto other people. It's almost like, um, I don't know, it's almost like a cult in a way, like a cult mindset. They've been told this. They believe it must be true because it comes from a reliable source, in their opinion. Therefore, because a coach they respect said it, um, it's true and they can just tell other people and just preach about it and just you know have a fairly closed mind be open be reflective be critical of your own learning like when you find something out or you think wow that's an interesting what think about why is it true why should it be true if there's a coach telling you x y and z don't just accept it and say he's a better player than me he must know you can say he's probably right he's right more often than i am but is he right this time and why should i think so and does his argument make sense and uh, is he contradicting himself at all? You know, everyone makes mistakes. Even good coaches and experienced coaches make a lot of mistakes. So train yourself to be analytical and make come to your own opinions. But do use the advice people give you in videos, coaching and stuff. But just make sure you can sort of be reflective about it and ask why for every, every what you hear. Um, number eight, develop a critical thought process that kind of follows on. Try to attempt an analysis on every spot before seeking help. Um, like the being taught facts is not really being taught anything it's just sort of like when you're when I was ranting before about being back in school and just having to remember and cram loads of historical facts and dates to write them in an exam um, it's not really learning a skill but poker is a skill um, so you want to make sure that you're developing your own skills of analysis 
every time you post a hand, it's not very valu valuable for you to post a hand and just be told fold. There's so many forms, it's just utter bullshit in the poker community. It's an unfortunate part of the community, it's like the sort of snappy internet geek ego, sort of my brain's bigger than yours side of things, um, where people just like to go on forums and say fold. What I like about Grinder School is that even the more experienced people, um, I know I'm not much of a presence on the forums, I don't really have the time these days unfortunately, but um, people like um, uh, JGB who owns, um, who runs Grinder School, um, still makes an effort to give people extensive responses and provide a why for every what he posts when he helps beginning players out and things. And That for me is one very positive thing about this place. Um, there's not that much of the culture of fold or call. It's just, you know, I've been in part of forum communities in the past where people have argued things like, well, it's the good player is given five seconds of his life to say fold on the thread, so you should be respectful of that. And if you want more information, you should ask him, well, yeah, okay. But to be fair, like poker is a community where people do help each other and it's good to, to always say why. But anyway, if you just get told to fold and then you say, okay, thanks, you've really learned about 1% of what you could have learned in that situation. If you'd posted your own analysis first, said, I really don't know about this spot, but here's an attempt at it, please pick it apart. And someone comes, that also gives people more to pick apart. If you just post a hand and say, what do you think of this? And someone says, I think it's fine. You know, again, you've not learned very much. You've not learned why it's fine. But if you post the thought process and ask for critique on that and also the way you played the hand, you're going to learn a hell of a lot more. So even if you're unsure, always have a go at it and train that thought process. The stronger that thought process gets, the better the worm can fix its own leaks and slither forward. Um, number nine, keep a poker learning journal. What's going well and what needs more time. So some things you'll be able to fix quite easily. Other leaks, you just won't be able to get your head around it for a while. And it might even take you like months to understand something fully. What is having this effect on you? What's slowing you down? What do you need to spend more time on? Basically, look at your learning and sort of divide it up in a sort of pie chart. What desires, what requires the most of your time, basically? How are things going? Keep a note of it. What have you done this week to work on the rear end of the worm? What have you done to work on the front end? How do you feel that your learning is coming along? What do you think you need to do more of, less of? What are you going to seek help on next? And what questions are you going to ask? How are you going to go about it? Keep all these things in a journal. And finally, have regular checkups to ensure the worm is inching along. Look at your game. Think to yourself, what have I learned? What new stuff have I learned recently? Have I learned enough? And what have I done to repair the rear end? What percentage have I done for each? Look at your learning journal. See how much of your time you've been spending on each part and try and get an idea of what the worm looks like. Is it a sad worm or is it a happy worm? Is it sad? Is it happy? Is it somewhere in between? Hopefully it's not worse than this. That wouldn't be good. Um, okay, that brings me to the end of episode six. Um, very common leak. I'm glad I did a segment on it because it definitely deserves a bunch of time. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed that, guys. And episode seven, I'm going to be talking about the next point, which is just having a generally bad approach to learning. Um, it's a very common fit common pitfall. I guess inchworm is like a subsection of that. It's one way that you can have a bad approach to learning, but there are other ways as well. I'm going to cover the less central ways in which people can have bad approaches to learning. And these are often just psychological problems um, that need sort of ironing out in order to succeed in the poker world. Sometimes there are um, just problems in that you don't have a good view of how you should learn or you don't know how to learn optimally or whatever. But yeah, I'll talk about that next time. Um, Thanks for watching and please leave me any questions or comments. See you guys in the next one.